when you see far right in the title, I'm not referring to the U.S. political far right with respect to, say, Republicans or the Tea Party. Can anybody guess what I'm actually referring to? This is a hacker conference, right? People yell. Not conservatives. Extremists. Good. That's the right answer. Those neo-Nazi groups, skinheads, violent groups that you have heard a lot in the news lately with respect to uh, lone wolf shooters, individuals who are engaging in acts of violence for some ideological or political reason. And Michigan is an interesting state when we talk about the far right because we have a large number of militia groups. We have a number of active communities that might be associated with the KKK or various parts of the far right. And we also have a unique climate where there are what are referred to as far left groups. And I'll talk a little bit about the far left in, in just a little bit later on in the presentation. But the reason why we even need to concern ourselves with this question of extremist groups is one that you could say is questionable. Many of you have probably heard about the concept of a digital Pearl Harbor. Raise your hand if you've been in InfoSec long enough to have heard that one. Good? Okay. So this concept of a cyber attack that's going to destroy everything, that's going to cause havoc, panic, and destruction. And certainly we've seen some interesting elements of Cyberspace is an attack platform in the last few years. Stuxnet being an excellent example of a cyber weapon being used offensively to try to cause harm. But beyond that, there are good examples of just regular types of attacks going on that have, you gotta be kidding me. Again. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, no kidding. Well. On the plus side, there are a few things that I can talk about without needing the device, which is a real shame. Pardon? Yeah, I'm going to have to put it on one once, once this gets up. How many of you have heard about the Danish cartoon attacks of 2006 and 7? Okay, good. So that's an excellent example of political conflict where Turkish hackers were defacing uh, any website that published a cartoon featuring an image of the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb in his turban because of its offensive nature toward Islam. So that's a, a reasonable purpose of attack driven by individuals with a specific bent. Stuxnet is another good example. Um, if you look through your program, the anonymous issues that have popped up over the last five years are, are again, excellent examples of ideologically driven behavior that take place on cyberspace. And so this challenge of figuring out how do we deal with cyberspace as an attack platform is a difficult one. Virtually any type of group can use online communications for the purposes of radicalization, indoctrination, and recruitment. Certainly ISIS is the key example of that in the last decade, where we've seen this massive surge in the use of Twitter as a mechanism to draw in interested individuals. In fact, um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of foreign fighters? just a handful of you. Foreign fighters are individuals who travel to a specific country for the purposes of joining up with a specific movement there. So there have been a handful of individuals from the US who have traveled abroad, mostly going through uh, the Netherlands and certain parts of Northern Europe to then go into Syria and other communities in order to join up and fight. And part of that is facilitated by recruitment via social media because it's a platform where anyone can engage and because of the near real-time connectivity, it affords great social relationships to build. The interesting part about all of this too is that with this platform, we have the ability for groups to spin a specific concept around their message. Whereas 20 years ago, an ideologically driven group had to depend upon traditional journalists news media in order to get messages out. Maybe they published zines or small paper-based documents, but by and large, their message was controlled through popular media messaging. And now we're at a point where anyone with a cell phone camera 
or with any kind of digital media can record and produce and demonstrate to the world what's happening on the ground. And it affords a unique opportunity for groups to push their message unadulterated out to larger groups. Has anyone heard about the Al-Qaeda lifestyle magazine Inspire? This is another interesting example, a publication specifically developed by an ideological movement to draw people to its belief system. And it has some very interesting articles, things like how to turn a parking lot into a bomb. So how do you get one car and then multiples to explode? But that's just one example. It's also connected with various other lifestyle issues generally. How do you live the faith properly? How do you live the Quran properly? So these are interesting avenues. The communications issue, though, is just one element of the internet. Then there's the bigger problem, and the one that we don't fully understand, which is the issue of cyber attack against infrastructure. The threats to power grids, to nuclear plants, to any type of electronic system. And certainly we know the cyber crime problem well, but the cyber extremism problem is much different. It's not something that's being addressed very well. Just to give you a little bit of information, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a social scientist. I'm a criminologist. And increasingly, people in my field of research are looking at terrorism, but they're focusing overwhelmingly on physical terrorism, the post 9-11 threats from different groups. And that is very important. But the broader issue of cyber attack is one that's virtually ignored, at least within the social sciences. And that's an important gap that we need to fill. Because if we don't understand what groups are doing, then we're not going to understand why they're doing it. And that is equally important to what they're going to attack. In fact, understanding ideology may help us in terms of thinking about targeting. And so what is going to be targeted could be dramatically different from what a group is interested in. And that's where thinking about ideology becomes pivotal. So with groups like Al-Qaeda and with various parts of the jihadist community, there's an emphasis on attacking the West through common vectors that will cause harm. 9-11 was an excellent example of this, using very small amounts of resources to cause maximum dramatic impact. Recently, in the last 10 years, there's been recognition among various movements that cyber is the way to go because the ability to, say, fly a plane into a building is finite. You're only going to be able to make that work once. It'll be harder and harder as security measures improve to make certain types of physical attacks happen. But cyber is such a complex environment that you can do a variety of different things and make it happen over the long term. And Many groups argue that the economic impact of a cyber attack is equal to or greater than that of a physical attack because you have the potential to cause fear in the general public about, say, the safety of their money or services and the greater risk to causing long-term harm to a specific target. So thinking critically, how many of you lost power? Wait, let me rephrase that. How many of you lived in Lansing in 2013 when there was the giant ice storm that knocked out power over Christmas for a week? Just a couple of you. Uh, my daughter was just born in November and we wound up having to live in Indiana for a week until power came back on. And that was a massive inconvenience. And that was just because a big ice storm knocked out services. Something much more targeted and much more specific against an electrical grid could have a great impact, and if it could be associated with or tied to an ideological movement, you can imagine the impact that that would have. That's where this issue of a, if you are comfortable with the term, an electronic Pearl Harbor could really happen. But the sophistication and the complexity of the attacker environment is something that we don't fully understand. In thinking strategically, we know what the hacker community looks like in terms of complexity, sophistication, and skill, right? You've got this pyramidal structure where at the top you've got the best skilled actors who have the ability to produce zero days, to use them, to develop new tools. And those are the individuals who we really have to be worried about because they are the game changers, the innovators, the ones who are going to influence long-term behavior. 
We don't know how many individuals in the extremist community of any sort fit into that top echelon of hackers. It could be one, could be none, we really don't know. No one's looking at this specific question. We know at a broader level there's a larger mid-base that has some degree of skill. They're going to borrow tools, they're going to build various iterations of devices or programs based off of what's been developed at the top. So they have some degree of complexity and sophistication in terms of their operational ideas. But how they can leverage those tools varies from person to person. If we think about it in the traditional cybercrime environment, you've got the people at the top who develop new software that gets used for a while among very small cliques or communities. Then it goes down to the middle where you see people paying for cybercrime as service. And mostly the people who are paying are those ones at the bottom. The ones who may not have a robust enough understanding of technology, but have the money in order to pay for certain services and products. And if we think about this structure, this development of the hacker community as a pyramid, this has some implications for what we want to know with respect to extremist communities. What can they do? How can they do it? And how can they do it well? And so that's where this question of can they hack becomes important. Because if we want to know where our threats are, we've got to know who has certain threat capabilities and who has no offensive capability whatsoever. Everybody cross your fingers, let's see if this will work. Nope. Great. Another dump. Okay. Well, moving on. We know that information flows downward, and so those with ability communicate that ability. And those who don't find other ways to get what they need. Within various communities, we've seen the emergence of various forums, social media platforms, and environments where groups can communicate and get together to spread information. In the jihadist community, it's fascinating because there's been a massive growth in interests in hacks and attacks. In fact, a very, very well-known manual was produced in 2003, a manual on jihad and it had very specific elements outlining why cyber attack is important. Because it's going to cause economic harm to the West. And it's going to do so in a way that's much harder to identify and much harder to mitigate. So that's one movement that's recognizing cyber as a pertinent platform. Beyond the jihadist movement, when we think domestically, what are our key threats? What are the homegrown groups that are a problem? This is where, on a political continuum, you have the far left and the far right. So the far left are what we would typically associate with the Animal Liberation Front, the Earth Liberation Front. Anybody heard of those groups before? Okay, good, some of you. Um, I'm a professor at MSU. At MSU we have some animal clinics where there's uh, testing of various sorts. And we were firebombed by an ALF group in, I think it was 1998. So their ideological movements are typically associated with protecting animals, protecting different groups. If we're thinking about the elf side of things, they tend to target construction sites. Um, there are some interesting manuals online about how to uh, essentially ruin lumber and construction work by spiking trees. So when a chainsaw is going through the tree, when it hits that spike, it's going to break the chain, jack it out, maybe even injure the worker, and it stops services for a while. So their behaviors typically focus around injury and violence to specific service providers or companies. But then you have the far right. And the far right politically in the US, where we're talking about, say, neo-Nazi groups, skinhead groups, etc., is fractured. There's a lot of different belief systems, ideologies, and perspectives. And these groups have a variety of different ideas in play. When you hear skinhead, what do you immediately think of? <laughs> Edward Norton, did somebody say? Did I hear that right? <laughs> American History X is an excellent example of this type of movement. Young, white men who are angry, 
Certainly any of the mass shooters over the last year get associated with different groups, whether we're talking about um, various factions of KKK or other communities that are present in the South, tied to the Confederacy or some other type of movement. And that's something to really worry about. But the question of what these groups know and what they can do is relatively limited. We generally associate with the far right acts of physical violence. This would be a shooting, a bombing, uh, targeted assassinations, particularly in some movements uh, against abortion doctors and other types of service providers. So their fixation and their general practices center around violence. But this begs the question, why are they violent only? If we're now in an age where jihadist movements and other extremist communities are moving online, are using it for recruitment, and increasingly toward trying to understand how to engage in cyber attack, why isn't that happening on the domestic far right? And that's a question that various government agencies are interested in addressing. The National Institute of Justice, for instance, wants to understand what the technological capabilities of the far right look like. How are they using devices? What are they using? And what kind of offensive or defensive technological use do they have? And how is that information put forward? So what I have for today is some preliminary research that we've been doing. We're in 10 different far-right communities in the US that are online. All variants of neo-Nazi, KKK, skinhead, uh, Odinist, and other ideological flavors. And what today's analysis focuses on, if the presentation can ever get up, is the results of that. What's interesting is that it relatively conforms to our perceptions. If your immediate association with the far right is something like Edward Norton from American History X, what economic status do you think many of these individuals are? Are they living in poverty? Where might they be located? What's that? Rural communities, trailer parks. Certainly that is a relatively valid perception among some movements. With technological access, some of these folks may have no access to high-speed internet connectivity depending on where they're living. Especially in rural communities, that's harder to accomplish. But there are other avenues that you can use to get online. And our research, going into one forum in particular, we've analyzed hundreds of threads, and we found overall that most of these individuals don't have any technological sophistication whatsoever. The boards that we're looking at are designed specifically to talk about technology, and their basic questions center around, unfortunately, what you would expect. Very, very basic questions. Things like, how do I get my browser to work? How do I run this in an encrypted fashion? What is Tor? How do I use it? And some questions about how to protect yourself on Facebook and Twitter. Essentially the kinds of questions that you would expect parents or grandparents who don't have any real skill to ask. I assume virtually all of you have had to answer basic tech support questions for family and friends. Raise your hand if yes. See so yeah, everybody in the room. The same thing can be observed here. In a group with, uh, at least within this one particular subform, about 150 participants, many of the questions that were asked were very basic. And there was a small core of individuals who were answering those questions. And the types of answers that they would give were broken down in very, very simple and easy to understand answers. You've all been on hacker boards before. What's the general response when you ask a noob kind of question? STFU, get out, that kind of thing? Sure, relatively angry, quick responses, read it, don't ask us, come back when you have a real question. Well here, instead those core members are answering questions in a very polite, very friendly kind of way and in an approachable fashion. So that way people will ask follow-up questions and they'll get more answers. So it's very different from what we would expect in a traditional kind of technological discussion, at least among hacker communities. And the interesting aspect of this environment is the fact that the questions are coming from individuals who appear to be older members and 
The most fascinating part of this is that the site allows individuals to donate. It's a very, very well-known site in the far right generally. And so there are donors who support the site through paid uh, amounts, and they vary from person to person. But you can clearly see who's a paying member, who's a donor to maintain the site. And it's those donors who ask the most basic questions at all. And those are the people who get the most respectful responses in general. What do you think that might mean? Money talks? What was the other answer? Pay for appointment? Could be. We also think that it may be an interesting opportunity for the people who are answering, who appear to be younger, to get a degree of clout. Because if you have somebody who's a paying member, who's relatively older, who's vetted, and whose reputation is strong, they may be able to do something for you a little bit later. This is only one subforum in a much, much larger environment. And so this may be an interesting kind of proving ground for some people. In thinking about technological skill, while there's not many individuals who seem to have any wherewithal to hack at all, most of the questions are very basic. There were occasional posts that suggested the technologically skilled ones were trying to inform the larger group. So they were posting Ars Technica articles, information from The Guardian. One of their most uh, fascinating runs of conversation involved Tor. It was right around the time when GCHQ and uh, US law enforcement were apparently able to crack Tor and were getting inside of and identifying individual users. So there were people saying, how do I know that I can trust Tor? I've tried to use it. I don't exactly get it right. But if I want to use it, how do I shield myself from risk? And there were some good answers there. Another interesting point in all of this, in addition to basic questions, given that any kind of social movement has the ability to spread from its regional base to touch national or international audiences, there were a lot of posts from people asking, how, if I'm in Europe, do I use the site? Because of the European Convention on Cybercrime, their hate speech laws are a little different from what we have in the US. So certain sites are filtered out of policy, and it even can trigger, in some cases, investigations of the individual if they're linking in. So people were trying to explain, how do I tunnel into the site? How do I get access if I'm in Italy and I want to use this specific forum? How do we make it easier for our European members to get on and to get in? And this was an interesting facet because it suggests this is a tech support forum that has an international audience. And among the tech support providers, one of the most unusual things that we did not expect to find was someone in the board who claimed to have presented at five DEF CONs, who's very active in the security community, but feels like he can't talk about his racial ideology in public because of the long-term harm that that would have for him, for his reputation, and for his success in the business community. We haven't been able to validate whether or not any of that information is accurate, but it points to this issue of technological distribution and skill and interest. If you've got a DEF CON presenter, somebody who's regularly there, who's active in the security community, that means that there are some potential avenues for people to get information about how to hack. But this audience doesn't seem to have the wherewithal to do it. Maybe that will build over time. We don't know. One of the few things that we saw that was any evidence at all of technological skill, and I wish I could show you this slide, but it's just not happening today, but everybody's got a laptop in front of them or a phone. One of the members of the group was explaining that they rebuilt a Linux distro of a program called Apartheid, which is a Linux variant that is designed expressly for the white supremacist and far-right community. They built it with specific imagery in mind, with certain uh, connectivity issues, certain language sets, and tried to make it downloadable for everybody. So they were really pushing distribution of this ISO for individuals in the community to download and use their Linux variant because they felt like it would help the movement writ large. So if you have some time later today, Google Apartheid Linux and you'll be surprised at the results because it is something that's been circulating for a while. 
So the builders of this were trying to draw people out and say, you know, please test it, please let us know what you think, we want to make this a more popular tool. That discussion was around 2011 and, and kept going from there. So it's something that would suggest there are a handful of individuals who know what they're doing, but it's a very, very small subset of the total. And so this brings us back to this question, can they hack? In general, in the far right community, at least in the ones that we're observing, not really. There is no offensive hacking capability. There's a lot of defensive discussion about how to use Tor and some other systems. There's minimal discussion about burner phones. But yeah, as a whole, these people don't seem to have the wherewithal to hack. So if the far right isn't hacking, why is the jihadist community hacking? Ideologically, they have different agendas. Both have an inclination toward violence. But in the domestic far right, we don't see the same inclination towards causing harm generally. The technological base isn't there. And so we're trying to understand what this means over the long term. In a 10-year timeline, if you've got a group that doesn't seem to hack, but they're using social media, and you have another group that wants to hack, is using social media well, and is trying to build their base, our threat matrix about these movements needs to be informed and clearly sharpened, because we've got to understand what a jihadist attack might look like relative to, say, a far-right hack. And so I wanted to push this back to you all. What do you think this means? If we've got a group that can't hack, should we just write them off entirely? Or is that a bigger challenge? Is that a bigger problem? If we just say, ah, they can't hack, let's not worry about them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. These are both very valid points. Mm hmm Exactly. So you've got groups that know that there may be some utility there, so why not pay for the service rather than build it up on their own? And that is something that we need to understand a little bit more. We saw on our site one person talk about Stuxnet and how it would be great if we could figure out a way to use this here. But that was it. It pretty much tanked out after that because there was nobody who could actually support the rest of the discussion. And we've been looking at a number of other sites and trying to dig in deep. And this is not just a one forum problem. It's not just a small community issue. It seems to be systemic at least across the movements that we're seeing. So there is a fundamental difference. And if technological skill isn't there, but they can pay for it, that begs the question, when is that going to happen? If you get more notoriety from a shooting, from a mass shooting, how much notoriety can you get from a cyber attack? Do we have any idea yet? Unless the group claims responsibility for it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's a good point. These are very, very valid points, yeah. 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 And so in thinking about impact, you're right, the, the target is going to matter in terms of what it means. So a video of a shooting or a beheading has much more immediate impact on a large viewing audience, whereas a, any kind of defacement or attack isn't going to make as much of an impact. It's something that could be done, but it's going to be much harder to glean. The data capture is an even better question. Um, how many of you, well, it's the wrong audience to ask, but how many of you had OPM potential loss? Anybody get hit in the uh, insurance hack from last year? 
I've had six of my cards reissued in the last year thanks to having a two-year-old because if you shop at Target, you go to Home Depot, all that good stuff. So my data is lost. What's fascinating is that we know and there is evidence that members of jihadist communities have been buying cards in data shops. So there's entrance into movements by one side but not the other. There's no real evidence yet to suggest there's any degree of technical competency. And so perhaps it's a question of just simple ideological difference. One is about violence, fear, intimidation of a very specific group. If we think about the far right, if their ideological bent is against specific religious or ethnic groups, hitting a bank, hitting a financial institution, or even a service provider of any type isn't going to have the same dramatic impact that it would attacking a specific community and its residents where you want to make a dramatic difference. Whereas for the jihadist movement, where it does seem to be entirely about impacting the West, that's where conditions are much more appropriate for cyber attack. So there may be some factors that are driving some of this difference. But it begs the question over the long term, we know that members get involved at different ages. There are, in the radicalization literature, uh, these questions of racial turning points, racial awakenings. For the far right, the realization that you are of a specific racial group and that puts you at odds with others is usually what draws people in. And the same seems to be true to a certain extent with some of the jihadist and, and other movements. But these racial awakenings and things like that maybe aren't necessarily technologically facilitated. Entrance to the group is something that could be done online, but what that means in terms of long-term impact isn't clear. How many of you would be at all concerned if there were a white supremacist who were defacing a major company? Okay. Uh, what if they were just defacing your company? Maybe is a better question. <laughs> okay, then it'd be a problem. Okay, so this is interesting. This points to some potential, but long-term, if we're trying to scope out difference, what our initial findings are telling us is that perhaps over the long term, we're not going to see a growth in cyber attack from the domestic far right. We will see it from the jihadist community. It seems like it's a question of when is it going to be huge because there have been a number of smaller attacks that have happened over the last two decades. So it's a difficult space and it's one that demands further research. And right now we're in a bunch of communities. Many of them are different in terms of ideology, but their general practice and their behaviors are similar. What we're trying to do now is to do some more targeted surveys and actually understand what is the technological space like for these groups. If you're living in, say, West Virginia, what is your internet access like versus an individual who's living in South Carolina? Is that potentially impacting the difference? Is there, say, a challenge to trying to get online and engage in a cyber attack if all you have access to is dodgy dial-up or you have to use certain computers or phones. So these are questions that have to be understood. One other interesting point of access and point of differentiation. One of the groups in our sample was attacked by a hacker collective and their entire forum was taken out. And the only reason we know this is because in reading through their help section, everyone was complaining that the new forum structure wasn't as good as the old version. It's too bad the site got taken down. Whatever group attacked them actually deleted all of their old posts, so there is no archive to refer to. They weren't maintaining it very well. And so if they're being targeted by hacker collectives, we don't see that same bit of evidence at least as uh, deep in terms of emerging against jihadists. So there's marginalization in the far right that may be driving some of these challenges too. So, sorry the presentation didn't work. Um, this is unfortunate, but kind of spitballing off what we can do. Hopefully this was of some interest. Do you have any questions? I know I'm well ahead of schedule and that's largely just a consequence of technological failure, so sorry about that. But um, one thing, yes. Sure, that's a, a good question. Um, the groups that we're in, at least in the far right, mostly just required uh, registration with the forum. 
Oddly, we actually got messages when we tried to set up accounts saying we are going to find your social media profiles and vet you, and if we can't, then you're not going to get access. And then we got access to all of them. So there was an argument that they were going to go deep on who we were, and then nothing really happened. With the jihadist communities that we're looking at, uh, they are registration controlled, but we've also seen some interesting technological developments on their end that aren't present on the far right. Uh, for instance, just trying to scroll through and save content in large scrapes. There's very, very specific anti-DDoS crawling that seems to be present. Uh, it keeps us from actually doing any long-term mass collection, so it's got to be very, very, very slow. Um, if anybody is a university student at MSU, we are hiring because we need people to do data collection. Um, on the social media end of things, though, the groups that we have been interested in finding are relatively easy to get access to, uh, same on Twitter. So our monitoring of these groups is relatively easy to accomplish, at least on the far right. On the jihadist side, however, it's a little more difficult, not only because of the language issues, but they also seem to be aware that there's a greater prevalence of monitoring of their activity. Uh, particularly with ISIS, uh, given that there are, I think, something like four million Twitter accounts that may be associated with ISIS, it's such a massive community to try to understand. It's, it's virtually impossible to just start jumping into. You've got to take a, a long view. Any other questions? Quick shameless plug. Oh, yeah. Good question. Uh, most of the conversation about Tor seemed to be just simply, how do I run it properly? How do I make it work? So less about what resources should I use on Tor, but instead, how do I use it just to anonymize what sites I'm visiting on the clear web? We've done some scrapes through Tor, trying to, or through Onion-based sites, trying to see what, if anything, we can find. Uh, we did the same thing with Freenet. I don't know. Do any of you use Freenet anymore? Probably not. Kind of figured. But we've tried to look in both places. We've seen much less related to the far right, uh, one or two groups at most on Tor, and there's some older documents that are on Freenet that don't seem to be active. So there seems to be a very, very small presence of, of any content hosted on Tor that's germane to these groups. Any other questions? Doesn't seem like it, no. <laughs> And will they be able to? Maybe. Sure. So um, actually, I'm a, I'm a criminologist. And in thinking about um, the bigger kind of socialization issues that, that you mentioned. Yeah, we are interested in trying to understand this process of, of movement from start to finish. How do you get involved in one of these communities and then what leads to an eventual outcome? Um, we have a sample of incidents of violence. So people who have committed um, in the far right movements an act of violence, whether lethal or just even a, an assault and a sample of failed plots and successful plots for the jihadist communities. So we're trying to reconstruct 90 days pre and post what their social media presence looks like to see if we can identify any peaks, troughs, differences in communication, emotional expression, stuff like that, and seeing if we can develop some kind of a typology to understand here's what an act of violence is going to look like immediately beforehand and immediately afterward what the network does, whether it dissolves, whether it actually strengthens after an incident, and what that means over the long term. We also want to and are trying to find ways to understand how certain movements may sync up eventually, like, say, anonymous with other movements. The reason I say this, in uh, 2012, there was a defacement by an animal liberation front group that also was tied to Anonymous, or at least they used the same language as Anonymous and engaged in a defacement. So there's some potential connection there, but we don't know if that's a real thing or just simply perhaps a cover on the part of whomever it was on the animal liberation front side just trying to, to draw some attention to their activity. But that is something we want to understand further. Yes, ma'am. 
in size. So what's the difference between, say, the far right and the jihadist movement in terms of sheer number? Great question. Uh, it seems like the jihadist movement may be somewhat smaller, at least internationally, based on total numbers of individuals who may be involved in location. If we're thinking about broader social media and networks writ large, they can be much, much larger. In terms of domestic far right, we know that they seem to have peaks and troughs in terms of membership. Uh, if you look at the online communities, they're a little smaller than what we see on the jihadist end. Uh, one group, for instance, one forum has about 200 members total, so it's much, much smaller than what you might think of with other types of movements. Whereas with the e-jihadist forums that we've got, they have thousands of members. Whether that actually means thousands of individual identities, we don't know, but there is some substantial size difference. Yes, sir. It's a good question. In terms of sheer economic uh, financing, at least on the far right, a lot of their funds seem to come from various local events. For a long time, a lot of money was generated through uh, music and uh, live music events, concerts and things like that. Um, there was a particularly large record label that was selling a lot of merchandise, CDs, and other material that was in turn being funneled back into some organizations. So at least on those very overt uh, social movements, like say the National Socialist Movement, um, Stormfront, those kinds of groups generate funds, but they're at a much smaller level. While there are some um, quasi far-right groups that exist that are on the periphery that are more like political action groups that can generate more dollars. But in terms of what that actually means for long-term financing, we, we can't fully tease out. It would seem as though, at least to, to get to kind of the core of your question, that the far-right doesn't have the same economic weight behind it that some of the other movements do, like the jihadists, where there's a greater skill and ability in terms of moving money, laundering money, and developing it from different sources. It's particularly hard to know now, especially with some of the mass shootings that have happened over the last year, and what that might mean for a general perception of very race-based movements, if they're going to be able to continue to gain traction, or if this is actually going to stymie their development. So I can't say for sure, but my immediate um, assumption would be that they're probably going to stay on the same trajectory in terms of, of development and growth. They don't seem to be massively increasing. Um, when Barack Obama was uh, installed as president, there was some peak, but that seems to have stayed about the same. There are arguments by some groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center that there's an increase in numbers, but we can't say with real concrete certainty that there's been a, you know, an X number of individual change in what the movement looks like. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, we've not gotten far enough into the groups yet to know, say, how many members appear across specific forums or how much sharing there is that we can observe. So one team borrows tools from another. But we have seen some evidence of individuals in these movements generally biting off tools from foreign countries and replacing the language pack with an Arabic language character set and then saying that they are their own tool. We've got a handful of them that are uh, DDoS related and encryption related, uh, just for, say, packing malware. So they're not overly sophisticated. It seems to be someone else's build if you go back to the original source post when it first came online. But they, they seem to at least understand you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's enough hacker tools out there where you can kind of cobble together some things of your own. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we're only in one forum with enough, uh, enough access at the moment. We're collecting data from multiple, so we're in the process of analyzing one. So we can't say for sure yet. It seems like there's a small number of people who have real, real skill, but there's a lot of people posting tutorials and things like that. So it's a little different, at least in terms of technological expertise. It seems like they're a little, a little better, or at least more cognizant. Let's focus on hacking. Here are some hacking tools. Here are some tricks. Here are some tutorials, which we don't see at all on the far right. Any other questions? Well, thanks for bearing with me. Sorry for the technological failure on my part. But um, quick uh, note, if you're interested in these types of studies, if you're uh, finding this to be a kind of unique idea, uh, we run a cybercrime conference at MSU. Our uh, conference will be March 17th. Uh, if you're a CISSP or you have any certifications, it'll be actually available as a, as a four-credit experience. Uh, we'll have the CISO of the university. Um, you may have heard of a guy by the name of Gary Warner at University of Alabama. He'll be one of our speakers. Uh, we'll have some forensic experts from Purdue. And uh, our keynote, for those of you who may be interested in something like this, uh, will be a DOJ uh, computer hacking and intellectual property prosecutor who will talk about some of the issues related to cybercrime. And uh, there'll be lots of social science presentations like this related specifically to malicious software, honeypot use uh, in identifying attackers, and other aspects related to cybercrime and malware. So thanks, everybody.